economics, sociology, history, commerce, management, psychology, environment, civil, criminal aspects to negative. Internationalization. Internationalization of students by opening their minds and knowledge towards international issues and jurisprudence and expanding their exposure to learn in a global perspective and on par with international students. On the able guidance of our principal, we already have conducted this year's multiple competition based on an international issue. And I'm happy to mention that without any doubt, today's program will add value to the internationalization of the students of the Savita School of Law. In addition to this, the Savita School of Law has also signed up a memorandum of understanding as you have witnessed the exchanges of MOUs uh, with the Peninsula Foundation with the aim of enhancing the scope for our students by imparting knowledge, conducting various training activities and undertaking research in the field of public and private international law, global governance and world order, national and international security studies, geopolitics and multilateralism, global issues in the context of maritime, air, space, governance, security, etc., etc. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is experiencing multiple trade transitions today, where politics and economics plays a vital role in creating impact on the same. Events that are happening in our neighboring state, Sri Lanka, today is an eye opener for any kind of democracy. This recent political and economic upheaval has only suggested that those were the results of poor policies and political decisions, governing options, and frequent constitutional amendments. Therefore, we are here today to hear from our distinguished experts on the reasons and the various factors behind the current Sri Lankan crisis, its uncertain future, given its economic and political conditions, focusing on its regional impact with the Indian and the Chinese states involved in it. I am indeed very glad to inform you all that this international seminar will explore several complex interconnected themes, including the possible future outcomes of the current crisis in Sri Lanka, the key challenges before Sri Lanka in addressing the crisis, the hard choices the country is facing today regarding economic strategies, political recalculations, and foreign policies, the future outcomes of the crisis, and the impact it creates on the immediate neighborhood and the extended region. Dear students, I request you all to make best use of this wonderful opportunity present in front of you in gaining knowledge on the international relations and the legal perspectives of it for your better future prospects. I would like to place on record our deep appreciation of the support and assistance offered by our administration team, the director, the principal, my colleagues, and students making this program a reality. I once again welcome you all for the event. Thank you very much, Harun. Thank you. It is my pleasure to welcome him, uh, the, the Peninsula Foundation's chairman, and Marshal Mateshwaran. Uh, and Marshal Mateshwaran is an Indian Air Force veteran with 39 years of active service. He's the former deputy chief of integrated defense staff responsible for policy plans and force development. The Air Marshal is an alumnus of IAF's prestigious institutions such as ASCE and TACE. And he has extensive experience in operational and command appointments, including being a founder member of the Nuclear Command, Space Security, Electronic and Information Warfare, Maritime Air Operations, Acquisitions and Strategic Planning. He has made many classified studies and reports to the government on issues such as Kaveri Engine, LCA, Missiles, and Aerospace Technology Strategy. The Air Marshal is a recipient of presidential awards such as the ABSM Artificial Seva Medal and the Vayu Sena Medal. And he has also received a commendation by the Chief of Air Staff. He has a PhD in Defense and Strategic Studies from the University of Madras and is also an alumnus of the National Defense College Delhi and a senior fellow in International and National Security from the Harvard Kennedy School. So I request you to please address the camera. Thank you.
uh, respected uh, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Chandra uh, faculty and distinguished panelists who are there for today's excellent uh, panel discussion, uh, distinguished guests, students, and ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a great pleasure to be here this morning and for this uh, excellent event, uh, uh, which we are uh, very happy to have received and collaborated with the Savitri University, the Savitri School of Law, and the uh, Defensor Foundation is immensely happy to you know, uh, put across this event today. We are at a time uh, when the world has taken a significant beating, to put it quite bluntly, over the last uh, four to five years. The pandemic of last three years, and of course, uh, political and democratic challenges across the world over, I would say, even for a much longer period, almost a decade. And what do I mean by that? The current crisis, and today's topic for the panel discussion is that, is the crisis in Sri Lanka. How do we label it? Or how do we uh, characterize poor governance or populist uh, electoral politics? Or, or uh, reasons that's beyond control of the state, the global situations like the pandemic, economic meltdowns. There are many factors that come into But I would like to flag one important issue, which is the characteristic of a decade plus across the world, which is the rise of populist nationalism. Populist nationalism works against the globalization which has materialized immensely for the benefit of all over the last, let's say, three decades plus. And populist nationalism is a swing back to curtail the advantages of globalization, but also to create a certain sense or certain level of isolation in different countries in the with and with a uh, reason which is not entirely true is the reason being given is issues of national security, issues of protectionism, issues of you know uh, domestic and electoral politics. So when leaders, when in democracy, the challenge is at some certain point of time, leaders emerge who would want to exploit the sentiments that are easily. Uh, you know, that can be easily leveraged, and that falls into a category called you know, what I would call as a zero national security state syndrome. And this is there across the world. It's there in Brazil, in Hungary, in the US, in India, in, in Russia, and, and Sri Lanka is no exception to it. What does this right wing populism that it is now, uh, you know, labeled as? What does it do? It creates a vicious cycle for the political leadership. You get trapped into it because you've now created a certain sense of, you know, reasoning in the context of national security. And your, all your, you know, uh, reasoning for the people creates a certain amount of guilt complex where every incident or every reason that's being propagated has a national security connotation. And therefore, if you are not supporting that political party or that particular government in its policies, then you will be seen as against the national interest. That's one danger. The second part is now to sustain, what do people expect in a democracy or in a, any governance system, even in a totalitarian state like China? People do expect a secure life, food security, shelter, and of course, opportunity for development. But when processes get skewed towards outward narrative, then governance takes a back seat and electoral politics take the dimension of populism. And that populist measures invariably have poor economic grounding. And therefore, the, you get into a vicious cycle of being trapped into a policy cycle which does not have adequate grounding in economic sensibility. And, and you end up in a state as Sri Lanka is finally in. There are many, many policy reasons that are attributed to it. 
One is, of course, populist measures in the last election. Second is, of course, the sudden radical change towards organic farming uh, and banning of fertilizers that impacted directly on agricultural output that leads to food security related issues. And then, of course, the outward events that take place like the Ukraine war, the rise of petrol prices, the rise of cost of living, and more important, to sustain a populist measure, the government continues to actually invest on major projects by borrowing money. So at the end of the day, Sri Lanka probably, as the World Bank indicated, has lived beyond its means for decades. And the revenues have been less, the income has been affected badly. Their main source of income is tourism that's been affected badly by outside even beyond their control like the pandemic. And you realize that suddenly the debts, the mountain of debts pile up and you are unable to actually meet the day-to-day -day requirements. Ultimately, we come down to the logic or the reasoning. As one of the famous scholars, Sam Simon said, nations tend to get trapped into what he calls as the pitfalls of nationalistic conscience. And this is what people will need to realize at, at, at a point when a crisis like this strikes. And this is a question that probably will be debated today. Much of the political polarization that have taken place, much of the divisions in the society that have been created for electoral advantages have all been now left behind because serious questions with respect to food security, serious questions with respect to employment, serious questions with respect to livelihood are now staring the face of every citizen, irrespective of which community, which religion, and which region that person belongs to. And that probably brings together the people of Sri Lanka together in rising and questioning the government of India. So this is a lesson. This would be the lesson that will have a geopolitical follow-up in South Asia as well. South Asian countries are despite being individual nation state, but still well integrated in terms of cultural links and civilizational links. And therefore, if there is a crisis in a neighboring country, the circle has certain to have a follow up on the neighboring country, other countries as well. And therefore, it's not in India's interest to see a crisis go beyond out of control in a country like Sri Lanka. Therefore, India will step in to address and help out the country as much as possible. So that is one of the aspects. But the long-term solution is not to borrow more and continue with the debt-driven format that I must probably give as a solution. On the other hand, it would be for the leadership in Sri Lanka to address the issues of governance more holistically, more seriously, and more strongly. So we have, for today's uh, panel discussion, Dr. Malika, Excellent panel of uh, experts. You are very lucky to, uh, you're very fortunate to have them discuss these serious issues. I would urge you, I would encourage you all to participate by raising questions, be active participants, and you will benefit much more in interacting with them. And I look forward to a very, very excellent uh, you know, event going along further in the day. And I would be very happy to see you all participate very actively in this program. The Peninsula Foundation is very happy to put this together along with the support of the Peripher University and the Central School of Law. Thank you very much, and I look forward to a very engaging conversation. We are immensely happy to announce that a memorandum of understanding has been entered into between the Samhita School of Law and the Peninsula Foundation. I request Air Marshal Mathe Shuran, Dr. Ramu Maniwanan from the Peninsula Foundation, and Vice Chancellor and Registrar from Samhita Institute of Medical and Technical Sciences to release the MOU. Thank you.
We have amongst us respected Dr. Chandran Siraji, Vice Chancellor, Sapata Institute of Medical and Technical Science. I'd like to give a brief introduction about sir. Dr. Chandran Sivaji, a famous BSc in Physics and MSc Technology in Geophysics from Andhra University, and later pursued with his PhD from the Indian School of Mines, Dalbar. Sir then joined the Indian Institute of Geomagnetism, Mumbai, and then did extensive research on geomagnetism and other geophysical investigations for delineating deep geology in the earthquake prone regions of the country. Sir has been working at the Government of India's Department of Science and Technology, involving science and research promotion within India and instrumental in launching new research schemes and establishing new scientific facilities to cater to the needs of the scientific community in India. Government of India appointed Sir as Science Councillor of India to Japan to foster and promote science and technology collaborations between India and Japan during July 2011 to July 2015. The first time Sir had organized the highest level visit of Honorable Prime Minister of India Shri Narendra Modi's visit to Kyoto University in Japan to discuss with Professor Shinya Yamanaka, Nobel Laureate in Medicine for the year 2012. This became a landmark to boost the Indo Japan science and technology relationship to its peak level. Sir is a Fellow of Geological Society of India and Fellow of Andhra Pradesh Academy of Sciences and member of several professional academies and councils at national and international level. On behalf of Sir Tess Fuller Flow, I will have to you. I would like to call Sir to get just the Academy. <laughs> Okay, good morning to you all and uh, my respected dignitaries uh, and the very eminent uh, scientists of the and uh, all the faculty of uh, School of Law, now my colleagues in the university and uh, my students. So, at the very outset, uh, I would like to congratulate the uh, Peninsula Foundation and Sarpa University for uh, having uh, signed this very important uh, MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, to take uh, certain aspects of uh, the present day context of international uh, affairs or national affairs, to take it forward and working together. It's a very, very welcoming uh, act uh, of today, and I really uh, enjoyed uh, in the documentaries uh, that have taken. So basically, uh, as you all aware, uh, that for the benefit of our uh, esteemed guests from outside, I would like to just a brief for about the university. So this is uh, a wonderful university where a lot of uh, multidisciplinary uh, studies and multidisciplinary subjects are being uh, cultivated and uh, studied uh, in this very campus. And uh, we have uh, several models uh, of the last uh, decades, and uh, the latest uh, being the Savita Dental College has been ranked uh, number 18 uh, globally in the QS 2022 uh, rankings. And uh, I'm very, very proud to say this. And also our uh, 
college is a very uh, dynamic uh, college and uh, with lot of uh, aspiring uh, uh, law students and uh, uh, advocates of this country. And uh, within the span of uh, 30 years, so the law school uh, has been able to produce even uh, judges uh, from the school. That is also a very proud uh, moment to say this other thing. So uh, coming back to the subject of uh, studying the, uh, discussing the today's theme on uh, Sri Lanka's uh, international affairs and the economic uh, instability or political instability. So this is very uh, important uh, to understand uh, by all of us because what is happening in the our neighborhood needs to be understood very uh, clearly and uh, with a lot of uh, transparency. And for the benefit of uh, the students here, uh, I would like to mention a uh, few uh, diplomatic things, uh, diplomatic relations which we have the Sri Lanka. So, Government of India and uh, Government of Sri Lanka, they have been actually uh, working together for a long, long time uh, in the diplomatic uh, activities. And uh, whether there is a crisis or instability in the country of Sri Lanka, the Government of India has always uh, come forward to uh, actually support and uh, then stand by them. Uh, even in the recent uh, present uh, kind of uh, instability also, the government of India has actually uh, sent uh, a tune of uh, 8 uh, billion, 2 billion uh, worth Indian rupees uh, amount of humanitarian support we have actually sent to them through our rivals in uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, a lot of things uh, can be discussed uh, uh, in this uh, forum, I would always uh, ask the students of uh, Lakhagas because this should be uh, viewed as a learning uh, process uh, in this day's uh, 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 workshop or the event. We have the very eminent uh, speakers today. We can all uh, learn so many things uh, from their uh, depth uh, experience over the years on the subject. These uh, discussions and deliberations, you cannot uh, find them on any textbooks or uh, so. Therefore, uh, please uh, be attentive uh, in what the uh, evening speakers will be delivering today and uh, deliberate and then discuss. And then also, uh, as my uh, friend uh, Marcel uh, told, we have to interact with people, ask questions, why not, and why it is going to be done. So this is how you can actually learn so many things and understand the concept of uh, any kind of subject. So with this, uh, I would uh, once again uh, congratulate all of you uh, for being here. And I also compliment once again the Peace Foundation, the Peninsula Foundation for uh, bringing out uh, this very important thing for uh, today's discussion. Uh, I am sure that uh, the deliberations and uh, discussions will uh, culminate into very uh, valuable uh, document or valuable recommendations for the uh, foundation as well as uh, for the country and uh, for the international affairs. So thank you once again for uh, giving me this I would like to take this opportunity now to introduce our uh, distinguished panelists. We have a wealth of knowledge and experience in our power packing panel today. First, I would like to introduce Mr. Mohan Guruswami. Mr. Guruswami completed his undergraduate in mathematics, physics, and chemistry and his postgraduate in public policy, international affairs, and management. He's an alumnus of John and Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University, and the Graduate School of Business, Stanford University. With an interesting career path that included teaching, senior management, journalism, and in government as the advisor to the finance minister at the rank of secretary to the government of India, 
His astute analytical expertise is well known and also travels even beyond his peers. Mr. Mohan Gunaswamy is widely traveled in India and abroad and is the author of several well known books on policy issues. Some of his recent books are The Looming Crisis in India's Agriculture, India Its Issues in Development, India's World Essays in Foreign Policy and Security Issues, India China Relations, The Border Issue, and Beyond, and the latest one being Chasing the Dragon Will India Catch Up with China? He's a frequent commentator on national and international TV and radio on matters of current interest and writes a wide spread and disseminated newspaper and magazine columns. His papers on redefining poverty, income inequality, backwardness of Bihar, economic development in West Bengal, and FDI in retail have been published in well regarded journals like the Economic and Political and the Journal of Public Policy Review. It is an honor to have you with us on our panel, sir. Welcome. We have amongst the panelists Dr. Ramu Maniwaran. Dr. Ramu Maniwaran is the Vice President in Charge of Publications and Institutional Partnerships and the Director for the Center for Democracy and Governance in the Chinese Civil Foundation. The University of Madras, sir, held the following positions. He was a former professor and head of the Department of Politics and Public Administration, the chairperson for the School of Politics and International Studies, and the director of the Center for Dravidian Studies and Research. He had earlier taught in Hindu College, Delhi University, before joining the Madras University. And he was a fellow of the United Nations University in Tokyo, Japan. He is a teacher and social activist engaged at the grassroots with human rights and other social movements in India, South and Southeast Asia. He has been working with the refugees from Tibet, Burma, and Sri Lanka for over two decades in the areas of peace, education, and development. He has been part of the development and implementation of the basic education policy of the Tibetan government in Sal for over a decade. He is a member of the governing board of the Samhota Tibetan School Society of the Tibetan Government in Sal. He founded 15 non formal schools for the children from tribal areas, stone quarry areas, and weaver's community, and also a school for poor children called Garden of Peace in Vela district of Tamil Nadu. Sir is also the author of Sri Lanka, Hiding the Elephant Document in Genocide, War Crimes, and Crimes Against Humanity, Asia Future, Dialogue for Change, co edited with Prasha Akhmadar. We welcome you, sir, on behalf of Santa Sulukno and Hansi. <laughs> Next, we have Dr. Jenny Pereira, who has joined us online. Uh, Dr. Jenny Pereira is the Executive Director of the National Peace Council of Sri Lanka, an independent education and advocacy organization focusing on peace building and transition justice across ethnic, religious, and linguistic divisions. He is also a columnist for Daily Mirror and the Lanka Monthly Digest of Colombo and writes for websites focusing on inter-ethnic differentiation and peacebuilding. He is a supervisor for master's degree students of faculty of graduate studies and visiting lecturer in conflict and peace studies program at the University of Columbia. Dr. Jahan acts as a resource person in community-based transition justice processes, preventing extremist violence involving capacity building of participants. He holds a doctorate of law degree from Harvard Law School and a BA in economics from Harvard College. In April 2007, he received the Raja Mahmoudi Christi National Award for Peace, Tolerance, and Harmony from the Interfaith Harmony Foundation. We're very pleased to have you on the board. Sir. Thank you. Next, we have amongst us Mr. N. Satyamo. Mr. N. Satyamurti is a veteran observer of the Sri Lankan scene, having personally interacted with all major stakeholders in the country for over two decades. He has been writing extensively on Sri Lanka's domestic politics and nations' bilateral relations with India and multilateral ties and the strategic outlook. As a journalist, Mr. Satyamurti, for over the last 20 years, was head of the Chennai Initiative of Observer Research Foundation, the multidisciplinary of Indian public policy think tank headquartered in New Delhi. Since his retirement, he is the convener of Policy Matters based China. His weekly columns in Sri Lanka have been appearing in two Colombo based newspapers for over 15 years and also in a common newspaper from Chasana. He has also authored books, chapters, and papers on Sri Lanka, Maldives, and India related topics with particular reference to native Tamil. On behalf of Sakya School of Law, we welcome you, sir. Next, 
we have Ms. Lovely Vijay Kunda, who is also joining us online from Sri Lanka. She is the project manager at Team Watchdog. She is an alumnus of the University of Oxford, where she completed her Master's in Education, funded through the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office Sheldon uh, Scholarship, in recognition of her intersectional work in the field of education in Sri Lanka. Ms. Minoli works with the Department of Education, University of Oxford, on diversity and inclusion in higher education. She is also attached to the Digital Humanities Lab at the University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Ms. Minoli is also in the leadership circle of Unconventional International, an initiative dedicated to the building of a community of young women investing in each other's leadership and supporting one another to be catalysts for change in efforts towards peace and justice. Ms. Minoli has consulted as an education expert on different university projects to the IRX project on battling misinformation in Sri Lanka. As an educationist focusing on context sensitive education for the majority world, she has been published in local, regional, and also international journals. We are really pleased to have you with us. Welcome. Next, we have amongst us the chair, Dr. Malika Joseph. Dr. Malika Joseph is a senior fellow at WISCOM, Women in Security, Conflict Management, and Peace. She also is visiting fellow at the Center for Policy Research, CPR, New Delhi. Until recently, she served as policy advisor and regional coordinator for the Asia Pacific at the Cape based Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. She is a part of many global and regional networks working on the security sector, human security, countering violent extremism, conflict prevention, regional architectures, and global governance. We welcome you, ma'am. Now, we'd like to felicitate our panelists. I kindly request our Vice Chancellor, sir, to speak. First of all, I request our Vice Chancellor to felicitate Air Marshal and Mahdeshwar. I request our Vice Chancellor to stay back. Thank you, sir. Next, I request our Vice Chancellor, sir, Felicity, Sri Mohan Bhuskar. Next, I request our Vice Chancellor Sir to felicitate Dr. Ramu Manivar. I'd like to thank our Vice Chancellor sir, for doing the honors. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'd like to call upon Dr. K. Karpaya, Principal in Charge of the School of Law. I'd like to serve the first week, second,
Sir, I like to serve the state back to Palestine, Dr. Monica Joseph. Thank you, sir. I'd like to sir to stay back and tell the state of Dr. Ram Mohan. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Going on to proceed with panel discussion, I request the dignitaries other than the panelists to proceed to the Good morning, everybody. First, let me uh, take this opportunity to uh, thank Samuel University, the Peninsula Foundation, uh, Air Marshal Zambi uh, Student, and uh, Professor Karthi Gary for uh, providing this forum to discuss this very important uh, subject today. Uh, it's been uh, two years since the world woke up to COVID 19. And in the past two years, the pandemic has wreaked havoc um, on everything in its path. Billions have died, the health infrastructure in many countries have collapsed, and the economy is went into a free fall. And wherever there were vulnerabilities and cracks, COVID 19 has ripped apart the band aids and exposing deep rooted structural fault lines and bringing mighty nations to their knees. It held a mirror to the world on what it truly was. Battered by the pandemic, the political centers of power in many countries have been spinning off their axis. There's political change everywhere, legitimate, contractual, peaceful, and violent. So you see political change happening everywhere. And A. Marshal Matisse mentioned a few, some of the reasons for it in the past uh, couple of years, few years. But if you come to our new neighborhood, 2021 witnessed the military back in power in Myanmar, triggering new concerns on human rights and political stability, and of course, refugees. And likewise, the Taliban is back in power in Afghanistan, bringing into sharp focus decades of socioeconomic development that's been happening there, but also more importantly, the plight of human rights defenders, women, and children. 
I think not long ago, many of us were witnessing people literally falling off flights. There was a huge exodus, uh, unseen in recent times that happened in Afghanistan. And in Pakistan, Imran Khan was unceremoniously ousted from office, followed by mass protests by his protesters, supporters. In Nepal, Ali assured in political instability when he attempted to dissolve the representatives and called for snap elections. And of course, if you look closer home and body, there is an uneasy peace that we can stay. Therefore, winds of political instability that's been all over the region, uh, Sri Lanka has not escaped that. And so therefore, it has witnessed mass movements and protests which began earlier this year, calling for the Rajapaksa brothers, both Kotabe and uh, Mahinda, the president and prime ministers, to step down. The protests have been led by the general public, cutting across political, professional, and deep-rooted ethnic lines. The youth have played a prominent role in carrying out these protests. So what is the significance of the current protests? What does it mean for democracy and dissent in the country? What are the key challenges before Sri Lanka in addressing the crisis? What are the possible future outcomes of the current crisis in Sri Lanka? So to talk about this, we have a distinguished panel with speakers from India and Sri Lanka, who will provide us with a comprehensive view of the situation in Sri Lanka from a multidisciplinary perspective. Uh, they will deconstruct the political and economic crisis in the country and give us a glimpse of what to expect in the near, midterm, and distant futures. So, uh, to make it more coherent, I have um, uh, rearranged the speakers a little so that you get a logical and comprehensive overview of what has happened. So, first, uh, providing a political and historical perspective. We have uh, Professor Ramu Anivarnan, who's the Director for Center of Democracy and Governance at the Peninsula Foundation. More importantly, he brings, he's been working with refugees in Tibet, Burma, Sri Lanka. He is a great blend of an activist and academic that he is. So I've uh, requested that he give us an overview of the political and historical and what's happened, and particularly address two, three questions. Uh, there was an economic crisis uh, preceding the political crisis, which uh, uh, Mr. Mohan Gulsoni will speak about a little more economic crisis. So, uh, so if you could um, say what is the significance of the current uh, crisis in the political trajectory of the country? At the heart of the crisis is the executive presidency. So, can we expect that to uh, change? And finally, if you could uh, talk about the three key takeaways for India uh, from the crisis. Uh, each speaker will have about 10 to 12 minutes. So uh, when your time is up, I will uh, set an alarm so the alarm will go up and you will have a minute or so to mind about that. Uh, so over to you. Distinguished Madam Chairperson and other co panel members, ladies and gentlemen, and my dear students and faculty, it's a great pleasure to join you over this discussion on Sri Lanka. And more importantly, because what is happening in Sri Lanka, I think we want to understand and also see what implications it holds for a country like India and to the uh, region in particular and the world at large. In observing and understanding about the Sri Lankan politics and society, though we said that we want to see the implications to India. I would rather like to see Sri Lanka from what happened in India and what happened in Sri Lanka, say around 1945 to say 46-47, and particularly the Constituent Assembly, the Constituent Assembly in India, and then the, the, the drafting of the Constitution in Sri Lanka. These two things always brought like stares at me whenever I. Uh, trying to understand about the Sri Lankan situation, 
and then why Sri Lanka went the way that all these 70 years and uh, what are the major challenges and shortcomings to the system. I think the constitutional foundations of Sri Lanka is one very important question for me because we are talking about the executive presidency and we are talking about the uh, important lessons. And a country or a society will have to take into understanding, particularly in South Asia and in, in, in India or in any part of South Asia, is that we are a multicultural, multi religious, multi ethnic, and classically plural society. And this particular aspect has not gone well with the making of the drafting of the constitution in Sri Lanka, the first thing. And then in the development of the political development that followed. So, why I say this particular aspect is that in India, too, right in the beginning, we debated about the drafting the constitution and very important aspects about respecting and recognizing and uh, acknowledging the plural aspect, the dimensions of this policy. And one word that still inspires about the idea of India is that the diversity. I think in the, in the Sri Lankan context, in this particular aspect of uh, the, the, the Sinhala only, has taken a very deep root in the, in the, right in the beginning. The country continued to pay a very huge political price. And then subsequently about like, uh, the question of resolving what you consider as the, the political conflicts, how political conflicts can become a source of economic deprivation, can become a source of economic marginalization. And then, Gradually, about like you know, the instead of cultural assimilation, what happened in Sri Lanka is that, like you know, the divide has taken place, and uh, this divide today it is very easy to say, like you know, over a, in, in a, in a, to a larger audience, and to say that there is no divide and uh, there's no economic marginalization. And but I want to tell you for most of you in this audience. In for 30 to 35 years, like you know, we, we have witnessed in Sri Lanka about an armed conflict. Whatever the last three months, the children, women, and old people, and the larger public in the southern part of Sri Lanka, in the larger part of what we call the Sinhala majority areas, of what they are experiencing about short of food, short of fuel, and short of electricity and short of basic needs, the north and the eastern region of Sri Lanka experienced it for 35 years. No one questioned it, not even India. No one questioned about like, you know, why, there is, why the electricity went off in northern and eastern part of Sri Lanka by 7 p.m. and until about morning 6, they never had power. They could not go for irrigation. They could not go for fishing. They could not lead a normal life. And the children had to be moved out of the country. So what happens is that this is politics is a great game of karma. You have to understand. It's, it's not a revenge. It's not, you have to understand things come back to you. How you govern the other people. And if you start governing people like the minority and the majority, that in numerical sense, the country can never be gone democracy. This is a very important lesson for India. This is a very important lesson for India is that how we see the larger people and like, you know, do we see people as in the name of religion, the name of language, in the name of cultural identities or various other phenomena or you see people in terms of like, you know, the human development and education, health needs, and then the political rights and cultural rights, and we lose nothing. This is, a, this is the most important lesson in understanding about what happened in Sri Lanka itself. But it may seem that you know, it's too idealistic to say that we cannot see the people in terms of numerical factor because our political system is organized on first past the post, you need an electoral majority. 
But I let me tell you about the electoral majority is that it goes on dividing the people. It does not aggregate people together and win a majority. It goes on dividing the people. And if you if you presume that there is a, a constituency, if you are if the government of Sri Lanka consistently for 70 years keeps marginalizing the other people, who you are who you call as the the Tamils or the Muslims or other population, see, you are actually appeasing the power elites. You are actually appeasing the power elites, and then the constitution does not provide a protection to all. And the constitution does not provide a protection. This is the contrast of the Indian constitution. And I, I would like to say to the students in, of law, very important is that the constitutional drafting, the drafters of the Indian constitution is that they fought so hard for close to over two years about thinking about the rights of everyone. This inclusiveness. Today, if you say something about like, you know, the constitution has helped us to survive as a nation and survive as a democracy and survive beyond the political failures even in this country. And that's the importance of the constitution. The country not only gets to draft the constitution, but we must respect the constitution. We must respect the constitution. But what happened in Sri Lanka is that the political majority constantly tests about dump the constitution and constantly use the number to tamper with the constitution and tamper with the number about like, you know, you withdraw somebody's rights and you bring in a resolution, political, uh, parliamentary resolution. You overrun the constitutional principle of equality and you continuously do that. Then what happens is that like, you know, almost like an act of law that you add to the constitution, they were making constitutions one after one according to the political circumstances and political pressure so that nobody would respect the constitution. That this applies to the, the what you call the office of the executive presidency as well from 1977 onwards. And you get to power and then you want to run a referendum. You want to run a referendum you choose the moment of referendum about like the power and build how to retain the power and this referendum is used as a way to retain power then not in terms of establishing broadening the basis of democracy the referendum can never be used for holding on to power referendums always used for broadening the basis of power this is the difference about the referendum used in countries like in Switzerland and many other countries where democracy expands by applying the referendum and going to the, the smallest details of people's public life. But on the other hand, you centralize power, constantly centralize power, and you militarize the society. And then subsequently, you hold the referendum. People don't vote for the issue. People vote for emotions. And whenever there is an emotional, emotions is like what you call political emotions are mostly fear. Our political emotions are mostly caused by fear and the sense of, when you say depri depriving others' rights, this is a fear. Let me tell you, when you take away the rights of other people, it doesn't say that you're off. You have to understand their philosophy. And like, you know, Mahatma Gandhi used to say this, mention that when you are oppressing another person, when you are putting down another person in the society, actually, you are also putting down yourself. You are going through the regression of denying somebody's rights. So in the process, you are dehumanized more than the victim. That has happened in Sri Lanka. This dehumanization of the political system, like, you know, marginalizing the other people, marginalizing the other languages, other cultures, it has ultimately dehumanized the majority single society. But I would say, when I say majority single society, it's that it is not the common people. Common people are very human. Very, very human people. Humane, I would rather say not only really human. Very humane people. They were denied education. They were denied the health statement. They were denied access to public. But they were denied in the name of what became the largest revenue, potential revenue for the society is to become a soldier. But who are you soldier against? You are against your own people. Like, this is a very important thing. Finally, about like, you know, when you're fighting 
the civil war or political conflict, social conflicts and civil, when if you consider that these people are also your people, then you should know what kind of way, what war to wage against. It can be a political conflict, it can be a social conflict, it cannot be a conflict in a way that results in mass genocide, criminalization of politics and mass genocide, unaccountability. I would say the soul of Sri Lanka is that Dasanta, the, the journalist, and like you know, the man who was killed, was killed by this present establishment, and he spoke the soul of the country, but there was hardly anyone in the country spoke at the time. So, like you know, today Sri Lanka stands at the point what Lasanta the Selva spoke, and the Lasanta talked about that the status and the force of this country, and like it when Gotabaya Rajabashi. When Gotabaya Rajabashi became the executive president and um, Mahinda became the prime minister of the country, and another brother, Basri, became the, uh, the finance, and one other brother became like uh, the head of the political party. If you want to ask this country, where is this democracy in this country? And then at the same time, the power, the centralization of power, is not in the party. Centralization of power is not in the hands of an individual who has the person office, but it's in the hands of the family, which is about like you know, corruption is a very important factor in India or like anywhere else. We always should ask this question about like you know, the corruption is not is not just a kind of like you know, misuse or abuse of the financial thing, but it is a deprivation of the people's basic access to good life. Whether it is a food, whether it is a water, whether it is a road, and then it is continues for forever in the name of the 60, 70 years and more. And like, you know, unaccountability in the system is very important. Sri Lanka has gone through this process of lack of accountability, of public accountability, corruption, authoritarianism, centralization of power, militarization, and absence of constitutionalism in the society. As like, you know, when you say economic crisis, I like to know if you, if you have all this, how okay, can economy survive in this country? Or any other country for that matter. I think, like, you know, the, um, to set this whole process, the system has to be accountable. Constitutionalism has to be restored to this nation. And then, more importantly, the public accountability. When you say public accountability, it's that, that you have to restore the constitutional basis. When you say restoring constitutional basis, is that. We have to kind of humanize the political system, which Sri Lanka is far from humanization. So it stands a trial, both within the country and in South Asia and to the international community. Like, you know, they have to answer certain questions to the world and to themselves. I want to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Our uh, next uh, speaker, is from Sri Lanka. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Jehan uh, Pereira online, and uh, he's the executive director of uh, National Peace uh, Council. And uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing him for close to two decades, him and his team tirelessly working on transnational, transitional justice uh, at the grassroots uh, level, uh, building capacity, and also uh, mentoring and uh, building the next generation of peace builders in. Uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, Jahan, the questions that I would like to address in your presentation is about how mass is the mass movement? Uh, because there have been uh, reports that it's probably led by the GDP, which is just about 3%. Uh, but uh, there are reports that it is a truly mass uh, movement. So if you could shed some light on it. And uh, secondly, now that Ahinda uh, um, is out, uh, will this uh, will these mass protests subside? Uh, or do you they also want to go WTP? So it will then subside. And uh, with Ranul coming in as the prime minister, what are the challenges uh, before uh, uh, Ranul on uh, this one? So uh, and finally, if you could just conclude with it, what are the three uh, takeaways you would have uh, lessons learned for Sri Lanka from this? Uh, over to you, Jahan. You have about twelve minutes. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Malika. Uh, I'm very honored to be present at this, uh, at this seminar, at this discussion. 
and I, I look forward also to hearing what the other panelists have to say. Already, uh, the first speaker, the first panelist uh, was uh, was very informative. I mean, I, I learned something from him also, which, which made me think about uh, the situation in Sri Lanka. Is how is the how is the sound? Is it coming okay? Is the sound okay on your end? Is is this, is the sound okay at the end? Suddenly coming back to me. But uh, uh, I can go on. To... Uh, uh, so I, uh, as I said, I'm very pleased to uh, be here and to uh, listen to what you have to say. Uh, especially you from in, from India, our near near neighbor, and uh, especially now that India is playing a very important role in Sri Lanka. Uh, India is always in our thoughts because uh, we are wondering when the next shipment will come from India, the next oil shipment or the next uh, uh, food shipment, uh, petrol, medicine, all that we are dependent very much on India now. So India is very much on our mind and we are very grateful for the support that India has given and the state of Tamil Nadu too has given us. Um, if I were to say this is something that at the beginning of the year, it would have been unimaginable that Sri Lanka would be in the situation it currently is in. We never imagined that we would be in lines for petrol, for medicine, for milk food, the way we are. The, the lines now in uh, Colombo for petrol and diesel sometimes extend more than a kilometer. Uh, and people spend hours and hours uh, trying to get access to, to petrol to fill their tanks. The price increases are in, unimaginable. Uh, costs have gone up. I mean, the official inflation is 50%, but many of our basic commodities have gone up 100%. Gas by like petrol has gone up by 300%. And uh, vegetables, everything by about 100%. So it's very difficult for people to uh, live. But most unimaginable was has been the way in which the government fell. The prime minister had to resign, Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa, who was our president. That is most unimaginable that that happened. And it has happened because that government and that leadership, the Rajapaksa leadership, is believed by people, it's widely believed by people, that they are responsible for the shortage of dollars to import uh, commodity goods for, 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 for the country, that the, the reason there is this shortfall, economic deficit that we are suffering from, is because they have stolen the money. That is the summary of the problem and what has led, led to their downfall. The, the belief of people that this government and this particular leadership is responsible for having stolen the money. And that's why we don't have money to import. I mean, that's the general thinking. Now, it is not as if we didn't know this earlier also, that there was a lot of corruption that there was a lot of commissions being taken, extracted. We have, for instance, airports with no passengers coming, no planes coming in. We have a port which we had to sell, which we had to lease to the Chinese because no ships were coming. We have a building in Colombo, said to be the tallest tower in South Asia, which is closed, again, Chinese built. So we knew that money was being siphoned. We all knew that. But still, we didn't 
care so much because, and this is where the first speaker, Mr. Manivanan, I believe, he spoke about the importance of a plural society or having a plural society and the Indian debates in the, at the time of independence, where India took the path of a plural society, whereas Sri Lanka didn't. Now, the reason why our people, the Sinhala majority, 75%, were willing to overlook the commissions and the robbery and the impunity that our leaders had was because they said, at least they are protecting us. They're protecting the majority. They are safeguarding the country. Therefore, we will turn a blind eye to the robbery that's taking place, to the commissions that are taking place, because they are protecting us. And they will also ensure, and within the country, they will also ensure that the Sinhalese Buddhists will have first place. So that is where we took a different path from India. I hope you don't go down that path also, because I know there are a lot of problems in India too. In, in this regard. But finally, when the economy failed, when finally we reached a point where we could not pay our debts, where the Sinhalese themselves were having to stand in the lines, when the Sinhalese areas themselves were undergoing power cuts, 13 hour power cuts, then People were no longer willing to tolerate the corruption. Then the fury burst out. And the fury burst out. We saw how it burst out when, in response to an attack by government goons on peaceful protesters, throughout the country, the homes of government members were torched by, by people. Perhaps in some cases, led by left groups, but in the majority of cases by angry people living in those areas who were taking revenge for now the suffering that they were undergoing. So in a way, I mean, the reason we have reached this stage, we have a culture of impunity where our leaders can do whatever they want. They can rob, they can also murder people they can kill people, but as long as they are seen to be protecting the majority, then there is a certain deference to them, which is what we have had all along. My hope is that this has broken now, that now people have seen this, the, 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 the untruths, the distortions that have been given to them. And in the protests that are taking place, which are largely youth-led, the youth are the ones who are protesting. The youth from universities, the youth from uh, the village communities, the youth from Colombo, they are the ones who have been protesting. They say, we will no longer be divided on the basis of ethnicity. We know that we have been tricked, deceived by political leaders to get our votes. We will no longer do that. Now the question is, of course, how deep is this sentiment? How, how, uh, when it comes to issues such as, for instance, the issue of power sharing between the ethnic majority and the representatives of the ethnic mi minorities, will people accept it? Will people accept regional autonomy, federalism, which have been big problems, issues in our country because they create insecurity in the minds of the ethnic majority about separation because in the Sinhala history, the ethnic majority's history, is the sense of insecurity going back thousands of years that here is a beleaguered uh, people facing uh, actually a Tamil majority. Tamils in Sri Lanka, Tamils in India, that, that is very much entrenched in the Sinhala mind. So we have to overcome that. But in a way, what, I, what makes me happy is that I see in the protesters uh, at various sites, I see the, in the youth that that they have accept that they are thinking now in plural in a plural sense. 
in the sense of pluralism, respect for human rights. Those are the values that they are espousing. And I'm, it makes me happy to think that the work that we have been doing over the last decades, which did not seem to be going very far, going, very, going anywhere really, that they suddenly have seemed to have coalesced. And they are manifesting, those values are now manifesting in the young people. And that makes me happy that that has happened. Now, it is also true that the, the, the numbers at the protest sites have diminished. And that the reason for that is because people can't sustain for 50, now it's gone on for 58 days. It's difficult for them to sustain camping out. They are, these are young, these are students. These are people who have jobs. They have to go back to their jobs. So the numbers have come down a lot. But I believe that the spirit of those, of what, of those protests are there in the, in the larger society. And as, as was manifested on May 9th, when government goons attacked the protesters, and then people from all over Colombo, people from their offices, court workers, hospital workers, executives coming with, with ties, lawyers, all rushed to that site to protect the protesters. So I believe that that spirit is there in the people. Now, as for answering um, uh, Malika's questions, I don't believe that it is the JVP, that the radical left group that is, that is uh, sort of orchestrating everything here. They are there, they are present. In a way, they provide the, the skeleton or the scarder who stay at the protest sites, whereas the others come and go. But the, the, the protest movement is much larger than, than the JVP. And the movement, has it lost its momentum? There was hope, uh, there has been hope when Prime Minister Vikramasinghe came in that he will make a difference. But again, we don't see that difference actually manifesting itself. The same people are trying, now we, what we see is instead there's a consolidation of the old regime. There's an attempt to consolidate. And uh, so we are not so optimistic about the future and what's going to uh, happen in the future. Uh, the main, main uh, challenge that uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe has to address is, is to get, is to ensure that there is the stability, political stability in the country so that there can be an economic plan, which the IMF wants. The IMF wants some economic plan from the government uh, where we will be able to show that we will be able to deal with our loans in the future. Now, this stability is still not manifest. So we are not very, uh, we are not in a happy situation at this time. And uh, I mean, my own belief is that with this, with the present configuration in parliament, we are not going to get a good result because the present parliament, the majority in the present parliament are, are loyal to the old regime, which brought about this catastrophic situation in our country. So I think we will actually need to go to an election an election where new people will, will emerge, new leaderships will emerge. And if you ask me what the takeaways are, the, I mean, the main takeaways that I have is that the, the need for accountability. There's a need for accountability. For too long, our leaders have been able to get away with, uh, with all sorts of wrongdoing, with corruption, with manipulating the judiciary, that, that is something that has to be dealt with. There has to be monitoring. There has to be constant monitoring of and checks and balances. The system of checks and balances has to be strengthened. A second takeaway is that uh, the presidential system, which wests so much power in one person is very dangerous. Because if that one person makes some eccentric decision as happened in the last year when our president decided to convert to organic farming overnight 
It was a completely wrong decision, but he insisted on it and the rest of the system gave in to him because he had so much power. So I think the presidential system is something that we must go away from. We must, I, I, I think we should abolish the presidential system and go back to a more collegial system, parliamentary system. And the third takeaway is that the work of civil society is important because I see the values that, as I said earlier, the values that we espoused over the last several decades, manifesting themselves in what the, in the slogans of the young people, the protest movement, and, uh, and in the fact that they are protesting that there is a lot of togetherness of ethnicities and religions at the protest site. But having said that, I also must say that in the North and East, there is less, less public visible support for the protest movement than in the South of the country. And the reasons that we can give for that is that the Tamil people feel, they say that even if this government is overthrown or changed, we doubt whether the new one will be concerned with our issues, will solve our problems. That is one. And second, it is the case that although 12 years have passed since the end of the war, the military is still there in large numbers in the North and East. And our military is a Sinhala military, Sinhala dominated military, and these are Tamil people. So Tamil people don't want to take chances with the Sinhala military. Whereas in the South of the country, it's Sinhala people facing the Sinhala military. They feel more confident that they can deal with the military, which has actually behaved very well up to now. So those are the takeaways I have, and I look forward to listening to uh, the other presentations and uh, joining the discussion thereafter. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, we cannot hear the panelists. We can't hear anything. Oh, can hear now. Also to go under because of the economic uh, stress. And of course, one of the key, uh, key takeaways you would like to uh, share with us again, uh, 12 minutes and uh, you will have the amount of time. 12 minutes or one minute. Right. The only cure, Marika, is is the plans all the other people. <laughs> so I will take you back to the situation in India, which was very much like what Sri Lanka is undergoing now. In 1991, when uh, uh, we had a hotel government, so on a certain day, when the joint security was done, and for why they broke up. They brought in He was in charge of this making money available, making money available for foreign countries. And even though I called them up and said, we have a tanker waiting, they got a that, and we have to pick that tanker up. And we have to pay money for it. We have to pay two million dollars for that. And the government over there on that particular didn't have two million dollars yet. And then it led to a cascading of which then led to uh, so 
Imagine he didn't give it to the Prime Minister. Then he and the finance minister, finance minister, was guess what, sir? Went to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister didn't decide to buy. He said, sell the gold. Buy it in what gold? He said, if they're in trouble, they sell our gold. So immediately they did a course of the carried some gold, went to the deal. And then who was it? Was dealing with various interests. On that day, nobody was willing to take my call. So the work went out that these people have no money. A huge republic of GDP of 300 billion dollars with huge institutions. And we were being blackballed by the international banking system because we didn't have $2 million. So the importance for students in life and in government or wherever you are. It must always have money in the pocket. Don't talk without money in the pocket. We have to, on demand, to come between government when you have to make money available. Now, Gold went down. Did our political leadership out of India is another solar leader. That is sold out. Why do households keep gold? Tamil Nadu women keep gold. Why? On the rainy day, that you, my mother always told me, I'm buying this because someday you might need it. Someday your mother might try. You know? So, money, that is what you need gold for. Other the useless metal. Find the living room. So, what happened is that the Prime Minister, the Swarath Minister, went to IMF, and the IMF gave us a few of reform. Open up the market, open up the open the and the private said, hey, can you buy the man? Said, I don't have a bandage. I've got a short-term government. So you don't have to wait for the next government. And the next government was the government of Prime Minister Rasmara. And uh, Rasmara and Manmohan Singh Gagushan, the set of traditional with the IMF, and got through that situation. Sri Lanka is in that situation. Sri Lanka, IMF is waiting with a list of conditionalities. I have conditionalities. Our conditionalities dictated by something called the Washington Consensus. Open your country, we buy everything, and then you sit and do the fully work in the country. Basically, it's that. And, but there's an old banking saying that countries don't go under a rule of attitude. Debt, countries don't disappear. Even Somalia has not disappeared. It's there without the government, there is a particular kind of currency for the mobile network. It's functioning. So there is rolling over debts. So Sri Lanka could also pretty much roll over his debt and he roll over his debt. But he's dealing with the Shylock. Shylock doesn't let you go easy. When I was in Sri Lanka last four, four years ago, I told them, why are you borrowing money? I asked them, why are you borrowing money? For insurance on from commercial banks. Commercial banks have a 10 year span. Chinese banks who lend money to Sri Lanka for infrastructure are mostly commercial banks. For infrastructure, which is as a 40 year gestation, you need sovereign funds. Money which belongs to the, that particular government which is lending, and that money will take be with you for 40 years and you pay very low interest rate. So that money has other benefits. Like on the secret project in Pakistan, 80% of the money goes back to China. So they're selling the cement, they're selling the steel, the equipment, everything. That's tight credit. So Sri Lanka got into a tight credit situation from commercial banks. Absolute disaster. And when they, when Indian Jackie told them, don't do this, they said, accuse us of being. Anti Chinese and trying to work against Chinese. He said, Do what you have to. The following year, I spoke at Pondicherry University as the Madhavi Center for South Asia. And I started my validation by two lines from a Hindi movie song. He said, Jab koi ke na hindi to hindi, tab mere paas kana pri. Basically, said that if somebody breaks your heart, that is the day you must come to me. And I actually want to get good to it. 
So Sri Lanka is in that situation. Sri Lanka's elite is a very proud and has very low regard of India and, and the Indians. And now I can see how they are choking, coming to us, asking for, for wheat and for rice. And should give it to them, because we can't afford uh, to let the country take over for that. Country is good and bad relations with us, and there's always been teasing us. Sri Lanka has threatened them when they have a Chinese somebody. So, few years ago, at the IMF validation function, I Sri Lanka named Sri I said, I will do a number that at Tanjavu, India has got an air base to quiet countries. And they will come to Ambatota in eight minutes. So how long do you think your little game will last in the outcome of a war? So don't think the Chinese will fight you. Chinese will fight where it's convenient and where it's helpful. But anyway, Sri Lanka played this game. And other point I want to make is that international finance works on credit and credit is trust. If you have one incident, then money will stop you. This is what's happening to Sri Lanka. Are the Chinese giving money? They have no money to money. First want to give money, the day the Sri Lankan government asked was India. And we have a discount. We pledge 2.5 2. billion dollars. But they say, do the any way you want. We know what it feels good. We've been there. Third part I want to make is, in, again, I made it earlier, infrastructure investment always goes. Any government borrowing for infrastructure on short term, a bunch of idiots. They don't know what they're doing. And I can easily say that in their haughtiness and in their pride, Sinhala and Eli were not thinking. They're always thinking of recognizing us and not sneak cost. Well, long term funds can only come from southern front. Chinese give money from southern front? No. Zero. They would squeeze you and squeeze you, take away 50,000 acres of land around Hamantota. I went to Hamantota three years ago and I saw on the runway they were drying the rice. No ship in the harbor. The highway not being used, the no coal plant. Anyway, that's when the Chinese came. But overall, I will come back to the situation. What Sri Lanka is in now. The situation isn't that bad. If I were advising the Sri Lankan government, I would say that the GDP is slowing down, but it is not dead. Economic activity is dead. We're down to about 3%. It's not bad. India grew for 20 years at 3%. We call it the Hindu rate of growth. So now you do this rate of growth, it becomes the Hindu rate of growth. It will come out of it. If you look at the economic data, which is all there, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, it all indices are good. It is going well. Public debt has increased slightly by 9%. It's not bad. What is, you know what the United States public debt is? 232% of GDP. Over, a, over 150, over GDP is the norm. India, Sri Lanka, South Asia, the most good. India's GDP. That ratio is something like 39 or something. Good. So Sri Lanka is not bad. The problem Sri Lanka has had is the exchange rate. Because your foreign exchange in your pocket are at present, exchange rate is correct. Went from 140 to 200 plus, 230 or something. And your reserve situation is okay. External debt is also okay. Now, what do you do in a situation where you're tight? <laughs> I, I call it the, the Chita Raman method. The situation is tight, say, tax cuts. Logic is if I give people who are rich people the tax cut, they will use that savings to invest. This is rubbish. They will use that tax cut to take the money to Singapore. Very simple. And Sri Lanka are no different from Indians in that. So tax cut went down. 
So then he gave the tax cut, reduced the taxes based by 35%. One shot. You know, if you attend, you need to handle the headaches that do that. But we also did a bit of it in the truth. But we're in a much bigger economy. That is down to 8%. Corporate tax reduced from 28 to 24%. Abolishment of pay as you earn tax and the 2% nation building tax. In effect, they gave you a 35% tax. Huge loss of tax revenue. When Raja Paksa, Gotabaya, and his told, would not have been given, but he considered an investment. What can you tell such a man? You have to say, you know, only way for you is to go out. This is the Chicago School of Economics. Even in India, we have followed the Chicago School of Economics. The tax cuts are good. Printing is bad. Now, that's a long lecture by itself. I'll then move on to. So, Mr. Gotabaya, not knowing much about economics, started printing money. So, when you don't have money, you start printing money. Start printing money. Printing money led to another question. Revenues start coming out because you are being given 200 Lankan rupees for every dollar, and the shadow market in Dubai is giving 268 rupees. Why will you go to regular? So official revenues start coming out. Money is coming back, like still like that, but not in the official, not in the bank, for which the government will do anything. So revenues are the same. So we also went through this to the past. Then, to meet this shortage of currency, Sri Lankan government started printing money. So this Gutenberg never realized that one day countries will do this with mints. The printing presses, they print money. So they started printing money. And foreign workers who remit in India, would anybody guess what are remittances? 82 billion dollars a year. If we don't have remittances, our current account deficit will go out of control. It's a poor laborer who is most Middle East, wherever in Africa, wherever who sends money back home and saves our economy. But you know, in the financial industry, to call that income flow invisible, because these are invisible people. They're sending back our money. So they call it invisible. Anyway. The third fall round is you had COVID, you had the Bangladesh, Mr. Bangladesh, the tourism traffic problem. Tourism earned Sri Lanka $900 million a year. Small country, in $900 million. And tourism has a lot of multiplied in it. Hotels, employed people, cooks, servants, money, taxis, lots of things happen. I am not looking at that. External debt. Like I said, foreign debt was 42% of GDP in 2019, but it rose to 119% of GDP. And a good part of that came from our northern neighbors. Who were, what they were doing, China, China was doing, he's had his reserves in America, tried to start shifting his reserves as loans to Saka countries like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Britain, and Britain, all kinds of things. India was the only smart country said, we are right to yourself, we don't own any money. Anyway, we escaped. But this foreign debt really uh, killed them, short term debt. And Sri Lanka today has to pay the Chinese 850 million dollars a year just to service that debt, the short term debt. And that's a permanent this is going on in the See, government debt to GDP ratio, like I said, is not, not bad. Now you have the agriculture debt. The problem with the Sri Lankan is they don't take advice from it. At the right, the right end of it. They took advice from a lady called Vandana Shiva, who said fertilizers are bad, pesticides are bad, everything is bad, growth in its natural. And then she was helped by a Sri Lankan lady whose name is Anuraga Padenia, a member of the presidential task force, who was a follower of Lysik. 
My single was a man who almost had Stalin to this. He told Stalin that animals and uh, plants help each other to any plant seedlings side by side for in clusters. They will help each other and they grow happy. What happened was the big standard. So, so you get people like this to advise you. And you go to take advice from track points, you'll end up in the pot. This is what happened to Sri Lanka. And what is Adelia said, in the old days, people used to live to 140 years old because they ate naturally grown. Can you imagine? In, 20, in 2022, somebody is coming up with such nonsense, and the president of a country believes that. So he says, no fertilizer. President means crop, rice crop is left. Sri Lanka is. Uh, students, would I kindly request you to maintain silence, please? So, so I said, collapse of farmer, again you have to go and buy food outside. Where do you come? Come to Tamil Nadu. It took some in the talent. The Tamil Nadu said, yes, you will give rice, but we will give it to Canadians. Then Sri Lanka said, no, no, you can't do it, now we will do it, you can't do it, give it to everybody. And we make sure that rice comes to a north. I'm told it is not coming, still. So what happened is we gave three, now $3.5 billion to Sri Lanka as credit. And a lot of that will end up at the ground. Because like what happened to us when we get more IT. So the America, Americans gave us credit. And when the time came to, they converted it into rupees. And then finally he said, you know, forget it, you know. Use it to develop some university. So we might have to do that. You know, because three billion in the GDP of three and a half trillion is not much. Not even one percent. And we can go it over. But will we get some understanding from Sri Lanka. After all this, I sent a note to somebody in Lanka that don't give money to the ass. Don't give money, think that you know. But the government of India has got in the phobia of the Tamils might get us. And Tamils in Sri Lanka, the Tamils of South India, they terrify them. So government of India is acting as if you know they also have an idea. Helping each other. Good for them. But I uh, think that, you know, Stalin has done a great job. He's given essential commodities as rice, seeds, life saving drugs to the Tamil people in Sri Lanka and is insisting that it goes to them. And he must follow up with more shipments because uh, uh, we can't afford to have a situation where we are sending money, sending. And it doesn't reach our own kid. Having said that, thank you very much. Thank you. Very poorly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant overview. I know it's quite a challenge to put together all of that, the origin of the crisis, and also draw parallels. You still have left the question unanswered whether this will have a domino effect on other countries in the region, which probably during QA could take care of it. So hold on, <laughs> you can pick it up during Q&A. Um, but um, I must admit there were a lot of controversial points that he raised and uh, students, if you've been alert, I think you can fill in. Um, so we now move to the next speaker, Minnoli uh, Vijay from uh, she's a project manager at Team Watchdog. Uh, she comes uh, highly recommended for the Stella World she and her team are doing in addressing uh, fake news. And uh, given that the uh, mass protest in Sri Lanka is currently a youth led, um, it would be really good for us to uh, hear from her from a youth perspective uh, on what these protests actually mean and why are these protests significant. And Minoli, I want to particularly also um, share with us whether the protests have been able to cross, cut across. Uh, the uh, polarized uh, divide, I mean, uh, polarized uh, way Sri Lanka is, 
and also what this means uh, fundamentally for democracy in uh, Sri Lanka. The previous uh, speakers all spoke about uh, uncomfortable practices and uh, um, uh, exclusive uh, majoritarian way the government was uh, functioning. But what do these protests mean for democracy in uh, Sri Lanka and have these demonstrations wrestled back some of the civic space that we should be? And finally, if you could conclude with three takeaways uh, for us, please. So, over to you, Minnie. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. I hope I'm audible. If not, please drop a message. I'm going to proceed on the assumption that I am. So Team Watchdog, we are an open source investigative research collective. And throughout the crisis, we have been tracking the protests, looking at what the protests have meant, and also looking at the economy and other aspects of the crisis in Sri Lanka, including the medical crisis. So to give a bit of context, um, by the 9th of May, when we stopped officially um, tracking the protests, Sri Lanka had 597 protests spread across the country, some of which uh, you would have seen that have gone for over 50 days, including at Colombo Golf is Gol, Candy, uh, Badula, and other parts of the country. So to give a bit of context, while the one at Golf is, the Gotago government in Golf is, is the most popular, well-known protest site, these have been happening for a long time, and even prior to the 1st of April, post the Mirihana attack. And initially, these were just groups of people gathering sometimes at the top of their roads, sometimes just groups of friends gathering at different places to protest about the situation of the country, the economic crisis, the lack of fuel, the lack of gas, and things like that. However, when uh, the Mirihan attack happened on the 31st of March, it shifted to a larger movement with more people coming and concentrating in public places, and eventually to a camping out creation of villages of protests. Now, there's, I do absolutely agree that these protests have been led by the youth, but by no means is this a youth protest or protest by the youth only. And that's a distinction that needs to be made because it's very, and culturally speaking, it's very easy for a government to dismiss, oh, what these youngsters are doing, what these young people are doing. But essentially, it is a movement that's been led by the youth but at the same time, that has been seen the participation and is continuing to see the participation of people from all walks of life, from different industries. You have school students, university students, to the IT industry people, to taxi drivers, to new trade unions, to teachers, to bankers, to all sorts of people joining it at different points. And like um, Dr. Pereira said, the youth or the, especially the university movement, specifically the Inter-University Student Federation or the IUSF, has been the backbone of this movement in terms of staying there. It's also somewhat ironical that the IUSF has been protesting for different education matters for decades, and therefore they have developed the skill and strategies to counter government attacks, whether it's tear gas, whether it's water cannons, whether it's police barricades. So they have also somewhat become the backbone in terms of strategizing teaching the rest of the people on how to counter these government attacks and what the government is doing against them. So in terms of why this protest is important, first of all, we need to acknowledge that contrary to what a lot of foreign media has said, this is not the longest peaceful protest in Sri Lanka. Um, people from the North and the East have been protesting for years, and that has never been acknowledged in foreign media as well. So that is a misconception that we need to get rid of. However, this particular protest is important because it has, number one, seen somewhat of a tangible impact in that seeing Mahindra Rajpaksha step down. It's also interesting to note that the trajectory of the image of the Rajpaksha, especially around Mahindra Rajpaksha, from Mahindra Mahatma, Mr. Mahindra, to Maharaja, or like a king, to a father, or Apache, to an old third or Naki Maina, over the space of 20 years, we can see the trajectory and it falling, and that fall is largely attributed to the people coming together demanding that the Raja Bakshas go home. The second reason being this is a protest that has seen the coming together of all sorts of people from of different ages, of different classes, of different work backgrounds, and of, of course of different ethnicities. And this has become a platform for them to come together and talk about their issues, whatever they need whatever they may be, 
So from families of the disappeared from the south coming to the protest site to mothers of the disappeared from the north coming down to the protest site, demanding justice for them, to um, journalists and their colleagues coming to demand justice for them, to general public asking a solution to the economic crisis, to get rid of corruption, to get rid of corrupt politicians. This is a coming together of uh, multiple issues and problems. So in terms of what I feel, um, so like, you know, takeaways and all, and I'll talk about three takeaways and kind of link them to the larger protest narrative. The first one for me is learning, and that has been a key part of the protest movement, specifically at these bigger sites that has been going on for days. They're not just a place for people to gather and demand for change. They have become places of learning. There are teach outs happening where different community activists to academics to first person accounts have been discussed, have been talked about. You come and talk about the marginalized groups in the country and their histories and how they have been marginalized. You have economists coming and talking about why the country is in this state. So in addition to this being an agitation site, it has also become a place for learning. And that, for me, is where the biggest hope lies for the future of the country, because a movement can only be sustained if, there, if it is sustainable, if it has enough life for it to continue, because the, you know, the impetus, the stimuli can ebb and flow, as we are seeing right now. The general life is so terrible that people don't have the capacity to come to a protest site and demand for change. But that learning that takes place, whether it's through movies, whether it's through literature, whether it's through performances, whether it's through discussion, are what will have tangible change. So my first takeaway is that there's a lot of learning happening, and hopefully that can lead Sri Lanka to a better place in the future. The second has to do with the disillusionment that you seem to have with the political system. Now, um, again, like Dr. Shahan said, there's the Sri Lankan political system is ripe with corruption, ripe with nepotism. But now there is this elitist political party system where the political connections are being discussed now more and it's, be, it's more out in the open. And that will hopefully lead to better decision making. Now, of course, this is something that we have to wait and see, and we'll hopefully be able to see pretty soon, because our newly appointed prime minister has invited representatives from the youth protesters to come into to come have a discussion with him to see a way forward. Now, that there are a couple of issues with that. For the first one being the PM is not accepted by the protesters because he is refusing, he's refusing to acknowledge the primary demand that the Rajapakshas go home or that Gotabe Rajapaksha steps down. So to see whether the movement is able to sustain itself when bureaucratic and systemic sort of traps are being, are being um, offered to the protesters would be a place for us to see whether the political change that we want and desire can actually be implemented, whether it can manifest. So my second takeaway is in terms of political change, the system change, the youth are more disillusioned to what existed. There's more knowledge, and knowledge is always power. Um, the third one like, is regard to the sort of groups that have come together and the ethnic divisions that has been just been the, basically the plot of the um, Sri Lankan narrative. Uh, so, for example, on the 21st of April, when which when, when uh, events were being held at protest sites in commemoration of the um, Easter Sunday attacks, we had different communities, different ethnic groups performing different types of rituals in the same place. Um, there was memorialization and different events and ceremonies to um, support the and support and commemorate the Mullewai Kal genocide that happened at protest sites. So it appears, at least for now, that there is some sort of acknowledgement and some sort of unity within these groups, within different ethnic groups, at least among the youth. Once again, for now, it seems to be a cohesive united front, but whether it will hold, whether the majority will step up and demand um, for justice for oppressed groups as well as other minorities is a question that remains to be seen. But as as much as the economic crisis and other medical crises and everything else is extremely difficult, stomach and terrifying, there is also hope in the way that the youth have come together and hopefully they are able to work for something better. And like 
So, you know, a, a protest or a demand or like a fight, a struggle being tear gas, water cannon, if that's the flame or, you know, the, the one that catches fire, you also need coal and embers to sustain a movement. And what we're hoping is that there is enough of that among the young people to make this movement have some sort of an impact and tangible change. Um, yeah. So I hope you were able to hear everything. And yeah, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, for that. So we did have a lot of problem um, uh, clearly listening in because I think because of uh, the low bandwidth. Uh, but thank you for that uh, view. And uh, when we have questions, I hope we will be able to have a better connection by that time. Thank you for that. Uh, we now move on to our uh, last uh, speaker. But uh, so once you listen to him, you will know why we have saved him for the last. And uh, he's one of our brilliant commentators on uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, what we would like to hear from him is against the background of what has happened, what are the um, potential future pathways in Sri Lanka? What does this mean for the Rajat of Sri Lanka? And uh, 10 years from now, what are we? likely to uh, expect. And uh, this in a nutshell is uh, what Dr. Uh, uh, means to bring together all the arguments together of the current crisis in Sri Lanka and provide us an analysis to let us make sense of what's happened there. So over to you, uh, about 20 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me begin by summing up what all my earlier speakers said, but very perfect. Maybe I go to the UC games, but the idea is Sri Lanka, yes, the division forces were at work almost since independence. Maybe because they never thought of uh, their freedom like us. So we have national discourse. Half by the freedom movement, the Sudeshi idea, etc. But after two, three generations, it is actually being played in our country. We are uh, middle of that. In Sri Lanka, it did not happen at that time, so it began with the generals. And it is not only the three division there, there is a deep polarized. Rural upper divide, rich poor divide, that is what started with that. We see only the Siklavi part, part of the 1956 government of the uh, Dhamirani Bhattanayaka. But the fact is, it was also a socialist revolution, democratic revolution through the ballot. They had to not base their constituency in the context. Of the Sikla Vikanti votes. So they had to necessarily divide it on linguistic basis. And let us also accept here those days, most staffs were in uh, Tamils, whether it is at the higher level or in the period, all bureaucratic jobs. 70 to 80 percent of them were in the Tamils because Tamils came from a hardy land of the Sri Lanka, where there was no agriculture possible at that time. Right? They had their own amazing school life, education, and came Kalabo for those jobs. Whereas the southern Sri Lanka was mostly a project life, even today in comparison. There were only rich and poor in southern Sri Lanka, no middle class. When that started blowing up in the project history, Necessarily, they have to find out. How could they do it? They divided the language. Then the risk was the way it came up. When the socialist revolution, democratic socialism 
the future uh, revolution failed, they had the socialist militants. In the 1965, when JVP, Janta came on the scene, he uh, brought havoc for two decades. Until 1989, when 60,000 to 100,000 Sikala youths of both genders and in the reproductive age group were massacred by the Sri Lankan armed forces. That takes us to the present where the Air Marshal was mentioning about Pakistan's case leader. Today, the situation has it seen from here. Is it going to get Pakistan's case leader? Or is it going to revive militant nationalism of the 60s and the 80s? Because today, the popular revolution, what we call maybe the Arab Spring of Sri Lanka, is multi transcendent and the rich, poor, uh, educated, elite, everyone is there. But is it going to be here? Because none of them have come up with the alternative, even the political opponents of Raja Bhaskar, the Rani Yukamsika, the present Prime Minister, they want it to go, where to go. What are they going to bring it to the table? Nothing they haven't mentioned. Because there is a delta. The situation, the economic situation is so hopeless. Everybody will be talking about the political situation. Okay, tomorrow morning, go to Raja Bhaskar inside. Right? What are they going to do with the economy? There is no answer. And the protesters in Gota Gama, uh, Go -Go -Gota, Gota -Go -Gama village on the beach, Kalabo beach, North Face Green, are they going to discuss? And what they see again, it is something like our next I am not comparing the methods. The protesters on the streets of native parts of Sri Lanka, they don't have an identified leader for the government of this day or the world. They have employed agenda, the Raja Hussars should go. There should be change of the system. Why do they maintain the system? There is absolutely no clarity anywhere. And this has also led to a situation of permissiveness. In the society, in the last two, three days, about 10 or 12 days have been shot by their personal adversaries or whoever across southern Sri Lanka in different villages. Now, suddenly that is still being off. And the government seems to be clueless about how is it happening, why is it happening, who is doing it, how to control it. Because on my night, when those attacks on the beach protesters happened, the police and the army kept quiet. Right? They didn't know what to do. They were now they are saying, so and so ordered me not to do it, so and so ordered me. And the DGP of police and the president had to call me directly for me to control these people. But that day evening, when horrible things happened. Independent of political views, etc., etc. 78 to 80 uh, ruling party political leaders, including all Rajapaksa brothers, had their property burned down in a matter of one and a half hours to two hours across the country. Till date, no civil society group in Sri Lanka has spoken about it. The Sri Lanka Human Rights Commission, which took offense. To a police officer opening fire at the protesters who were bent on setting fire to a petrol tanker. They haven't spoken. The Western University of Congo haven't spoken. This is, this means we are entering this age of lawlessness per act policy. If this government, the man who is getting the government today in prison quota, he is credited with. Finishing of the NTP with the act. Either he is unwilling or incapable of doing it. And if he is not able to build law and order back in the country, I don't think anyone can. And this protest is attributed in part at least. 
and own the facility by two less militant groups, rather one JVP, which is no more militant. They have voted up that we were behind this part of the countries. And a regular group of JVP got many of you have even heard of frontline sources for the led by a Tamil uh, ex JVP who escaped from prison, settled down in Australia as an Australian citizen, came back after the war and uh, founded this FSP saying JVP is not even revolutionary. Revolutionary. We don't know their agenda. No one in Sri Lanka, including our own society, friends, who talk only about other success or not take note of this. This is going to be a huge question mark before that case. And the 21 year they are talking about, they want to go to go. And already, as yes, someone was mentioning, in the last three years, we have got two uh, committees working on two different constitutions, where there was a state and then we are talking about the 28, 21 day, that is 21 amendment to the constitution, etc. My problem is that they, not only they have too many uh, uh, constitutions, we have underlined by uh, amendments to the constitution, our constitution, which is as it is common as the new constitution. So I am not ripping about it, but we have to accept that. In terms of democracy, or even personal democracy, you call whatever. It is the man who matters. The position is incidental. As long as a single man can win and lose election, whether he is executive president or he is Pachaya president, his powers are unalterable, unchallenged. This is a real situation in Sri Lanka. You take away, see, God the right to give the instance of Mahitra Rajapaksa. He won an election in 2010 after the war. In 2015, he lost the war. Still, he got 47 percent votes. The beauty is nearly 40 to 45 percent. He retained in the provincial council election. They are equivalent of a giant election, etc. Like so, it is the man who met him. This is no even today. And the problem with the protesters is. They do not have a leadership. They, no one has given us a policy statement. This is what we have won. Exactly. This is going to create a problem. If today at the afternoon, literally, the cabinet decides that we don't want it to be. Even if the 21 year discourses within political parties and if you go to parliament, the professors out there are not concerned. Or the JVP, as I was mentioning, they have openly stated, if Gorda doesn't go, we are going to get out of parliament. And no one has been challenged. This is a kind of situation, if allowed to continue, there may not be a single job to talk seriously about the business. And that comes to the economy also because today they have put the cop before the house. The world is ready to help Sri Lanka or the economy. They are not concerned really about the politics of Sri Lanka. And they are busy already to play more. <coughs> and here the problem again is uh, the Western nations in Sri Lanka or their interest in Sri Lanka mostly is focused on their human rights, their agendas, not the economy. For instance, the last three of the economic crisis. India is the only country that has been hit with them. Japan offered 1.5 billion dollars. That is peanuts in today's Nivedas crisis media. Last week, Russia offered 90,000 tons of uh, oil. One thing that there is a crisis involving a Russian commercial aircraft, aeroflot aircraft in the Sri Lankan. Uh, both. And I don't think the Russians immediately, they, in Moscow, they call it the Sri Lankan uh, ambassador. And that relationship is straight. 
So if this is the kind of situation, I am not saying a business behind that cannot be issue, but if this is the kind of situation, the economic recovery is going to take much more time than anticipated. What? So I am not an economist, more to solve this, yes. But given my layered knowledge of civil economy, I think it is going to take me around three years to stabilize with all as uh, positive factors, and then they have to start covering, which is about uh, I put that economic recovery to old pre-COVID days is going to take about a total of 10 years. And one problem with China, like, which is a takeaway from India, is it is not the China that alone gets us, not the huge investment of infrastructure which doesn't produce return that alone matters. It was a job that grows if there was a growth. Every job, not only the, the investment to build back the most country in terms of material, etc. Even jobs, no student got a single job out of it. That was a crisis situation there, which our investors there. Whether it is government of India or private Indian consortiums or groups, they have to remind themselves that they have to gain jobs. Because we are putting, uh, putting in a lot of money. See, for instance, the trick of oil for refurbishment, it is going to take a lot of time and a lot of industry. Like the Adani group is there. Government of India should definitely tell these people to create jobs locally. It is not out of fear at all. That is the only way the economy can be held to grow on its own. Then the other caretaker is around in for India. Sri Lanka is not the only case. Pakistan economy is not doing well. Nepal economy is not doing well. And on the street of Tanzania, if you ask, going by what is happening in Sri Lanka, there is an unmentioned anticipation will it happen. This I know is happening in all around our neighborhoods, Indian state in the neighborhood. I think the, the government has taken a closer look and see how to alleviate that unmentioned or talked about fear cycles. Because at the end of it, that is what will trigger uh, the situation in terms of in times of crisis. Two, India has to ask itself and ask our so called God Alex, what are they going to do about free funding? Because as I said, only India has free money. It is not a question of India giving it, but India may so have to do away with other nations. And our forex comfortable forex position will remain only as long as we don't use it. And we also keep money. In this context, I think government of India has to take a holistic view of the economic crisis, possible political impact in the neighborhood, and how it is all going to affect India also. And on Sri Lanka, ultimately, let us not accept that we are going to get the noise, Sri Lanka, something like that, that is wishful thinking. There is a sovereign nation on the protest rights that may or others may or may not say. They are adding their product to a shelter, both in Candy, in uh, Colombo Beach, and elsewhere. So there is a feeling that we have to fight our country with that type of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for waking up all the students. Now of them are alert because they can't be good enough. Hear uh, a particular perspective, and I think uh, they got a dose of reality as to you know what actually it means. Uh, what do you weigh in? I mean, do we still fight for democracy, or should we settle for uh, political stability in the face of uh, economic reforms that are coming uh, our way? Uh, so, will this uh, mass movement there uh, transform the polity in Sri Lanka? 
Or will it end up like the Arab Spring, what happened in Tunisia, where eventually it brought in more political instability uh, than what it began with? Uh, so I think uh, you've uh, heard multiple uh, different voices, different perspectives, starting from the need for accountability, plural voices, and also uh, we ended with uh, the need for political stability. Should we prioritize political stability over democracy? So I think you've had uh, all these views. Uh, the floor is now uh, open for uh, questions. So uh, whoever has a question, please introduce yourself and then uh, please say which of the panelists your question is uh, addressed to. We have about uh, 15 minutes for, for a Q&A session. Students may take side of this. Uh, so, uh, so this is a uh, Ramakrishnan from second year. Uh, so, um, my, uh, so uh, as you have stated that uh, Srinath is basically dependent in the two. Uh, Ramakrishnan. Who is it addressed to? Uh, to to this uh, on economy. Uh, on economy. So, uh, so sir, uh, uh, as per uh, as per the current uh, current uh, economy of the Sri Lanka, whether uh, they, they, they must go to any other uh, sectors like uh, job sector and uh, uh, other than tourism. Uh, so my question is this only. Okay. Which can, you know, the way we carry the basic problem from the society, the society itself. Do you think there is need for international intervention in such an enterprise? Thank you. As you know, on the human rights issue, particularly allegations of war crimes and accord of issues, there is already international intervention. Any war units or any war units of case that better involved with that. But that directly shouldn't affect any in international participation in the economic uplift 
On the day we took over as Prime Minister, Mr. Vikramsi has said, I am looking at an eight season of absorption kind of thing. And told that the UN has yesterday or day before yesterday issued a statement calling upon nations to do it. But I'm very sure that somewhere along the way, the Western nations will bring uh, whether it is IMOP, beyond the 4 billion or what we call, or a consortium kind of thing. They will look at it. And the irony of the Sri situation today is that this followed two parameters. When the Rajapaksa were there, they were condemned saying that the government was not possible. In the same running response came up, Prime right, Minister, when in 2014 and 19, they came with some kind of OP arrangement. But the Sivita was never all that it looks like. Right? So some kind of a mutual agreement has to be put out in the coming weeks because the next session of UN Institute, September, by July end, everyone will be making noise outside Sivita and inside Sivita. So I would wonder, I don't have the situation to be the same foreign minister, GLPDs, who went back to Sivita, there is no or human rights violations or war crimes. He may be both to go and say something slightly different or poorly different. And these two will be definitely there won't be direct linkage. But without that, I don't think the is going to put in money. This is going to trigger further uh, nationalism, going beyond populist nationalism. It can then become military nationalism or not, and it is too early. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, I'm Sakshi. I have two questions. The first is to Mr. Guruswami. Uh, India's support to Sri Lanka under the lines of credit and humanitarian support involves a lot of logistics. Uh, does the support include the cost of these logistics or if not, who bears the cost? Uh, my second question is uh, open to the panel. Uh, the Sri Lankan embassies and missions around the world have come under immense criticism during the recent economic crisis. How efficient are they in executing their responsibility, considering the humongous resources required to run a mission? As an analogy, uh, Indian embassies and missions played a vital role during the 1991 economic crisis, Kargil War, and the 2004 tsunami. What uh, are missions doing in terms of bringing additional resources to the country? Yeah, yeah. Put her on this supply from CIS is costing to the Senate, get down the price. There will be a state telegram box. It won't be much. But the biggest problem is today, for the last 50 days, 40,000 tons of rice sitting at Colombo. Look at the rice. On where it should go. It's less than time to get active on. Both ships will pile up. This is a chronic problem in South Asia with bureaucracy, out of control. 1500 trucks are sitting outside Bangladesh with feet for the last 20 years. Because the Commerce Ministry does not accept what the MEM, this is the most official government order. I miss this word, it's not enough. So we have a problem situation like in Sri Lanka also. And there was a controversy on Tamil Nadu saying that our rice is not. But what is the right question? What kind of roles can Sri Lanka mission play in sending resources to the country? I think the missions usually have a prominent role in following the national situation, the economy, politics, or even the science and technology. And uh, what happened in Sri Lanka in the last 10 years is that the appointments in the ministry, particularly in the missions, 
mostly they were in the uh, what you call the military side, and they were they were neither professional professionally trained diplomats, and uh, so they I don't think they responded to rose to this occasion. The military, I mean, the militarization of the bureaucracy has taken a very big toll on Sri Lankan diplomacy as well. Most, you see the major countries, whether in the UK or in several other countries, most of them were like people who operated during the 2007, 2010, the military operations. They were all rewarded for military operations. They are not going to handle your economy. They are not handling your diplomats. Most of them cannot come and speak in public. They are they are questioned for war crimes. So this is a shadow, and uh, this is a particular shadow that hangs over the Sri Lankan diplomats. I would like that. Uh, Minna, do you want to respond to that? Um, not on the embassies. Uh, General, to... uh, in the meantime, we'll try to put you up on the screen. Uh, you mentioned tsunami. Sri Lankan diplomats and missions across the world did a wonderful job during the tsunami. We are there were the worst state that has. So, I have the political situation stabilizes and the instructions clearly goes from Kalambo to these bishops, they may be able to raise the issue. Two, it is not just military session of the bureaucracy that it is. The problem in Sri Lanka is no party or government not to address is politicization of bureaucrats, diplomats across the world in Sri Lanka, not just now. For the past 15 20 years, are mostly political acolytes whom the government of the day could not absorb their domestic. And the Kenyan diplomat had to take instructions from them, and there is a lot of tensions there. But there are exceptions like the today Sri Lankan High Commissioner in India, Delhi. He is the right person for the right job at the right time. The Kenyan diplomat. Have gone through procedures as uh, Dr. Mohan Gurswami mentioned in another context. No decision would be possible. He is a politician with a lot of political experience. So he is able to wear through some of these issues. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mohan, would you like to add on to it? Or I'll just uh, ask Yeah, that's just the one one thought I have is that uh, our our foreign service has been much criticized in recent times for being all political appoint many political appointments and people who are totally unsuited to taking those positions. Uh, India is an exception. In India, we got uh, one of the most uh, competent uh, former politician and also technocrat who is able to hold his own and uh, make a convincing case. But in many other foreign missions, we have people who have been sent as uh, for, for just political patronage reasons. And they have also gone with this wrong idea that they have to uh, uphold the image of the country and uh, you know present, uh, try and defend the country in terms of its human rights record rather than uh, engage in business and getting uh, uh, trade and commercial opportunities.
if I may make one more comment, I mean, since there's a silence, I think I believe that the Sri Lankan people really want a change. They really want, uh, and if there's an election, there will be a very big change. The cycling of the funds that are overlooking for the majority of protection is now all gone in the background. Accountability is the requirement of people. Do you think this would revise the revival of a socialist movement and put brakes on the neoliberal strength and the center stage that the neoliberal process has taken hold for the last 40 years of present Sri Lanka? Will this revive the battle between the communists and the socialists with the existing you know, establishments in Sri Lanka? Uh, thank you, sir, for that. So, I will not be back in And uh, just want to give a heads up uh, if there are any last questions after this response, uh, we, we will have time for just one more question. So, uh, be ready for that and then we will post the search. Thank you. You can ask the hand to answer. I think audio is. Uh, the problem today is, on the ground, there is a socialist constituency, as it said, that got democratized in 56 and it slipped out. Then it's still consolidated in the form of the Stevens of Freedom Party of the Banda and passed on to the Rajapis. Today, that socialist constituency, we are talking about nearly 40 45 percent of the votes. That is a state. And some of the issues, because for instance, the first man raised the band of the war against the Rasmussen was a deputy leader, Bimal Diramansa, who was a former JVP leader, and whose political continuance in the history of office, etc., owed exclusively to Mahindra Rasmussen. Right? Today, in the Rajapaksa state, those 40% of the vote is up for takes. And of that, uh, Dr. Madiga mentioned three percent, JVP has three percent, what the JVP has only now. But they have the wonderful capacity to bring together 500,000 to, uh, 500, uh, to 1 million voters to any rally events, but they don't convert it to votes. How I know. So this is one crisis they have to attach. Because if the Rajapaksa is great, and this JVP had about 10 to 12 percent vote 15 years back, that means the was a capture to the local government. And as I mentioned about the FSP, Frontline Socialist Party of Premukumar Rana, Gudaratna, whether JVP and they are going to work together or not. Uh, against each other. As of now, they are working against each other. So, so how are they going to divide? The trade unions, and unlike India, there are strong trade unions even today in Sri Lanka. There are strong student university unions in Sri Lanka. But there is, like in India, all the conventional communist parties are almost dead and gone. Their latest leader should be. 70 or 80 years old. But the socialist agenda or the identity sticks with SLPP of the Rajapaksa. And incidentally, the last five years, the two original major political parties of the country they are dead. UNP, of this country is only MP, and SLP, from which the Rajapaksa broke away and founded the SLPP. So there is a churning of the political threat, the socio-political threat, I would say. So how this plays out and the political leadership there and the tax like the Jahans and others have to apply their mind to see what should come out of this, that what could come out of it. Thank you. Any last uh, question? And 
also to the panelists. After the last question, uh, all of you will have a minute to maybe uh, say any final analysis points if you want to share. If you could just do that, including Minali and Jahan, um, any last points that you want to share? So good afternoon. This is Yash from second year. I have a question for the first panelist. So in the current situation in Sri Lanka, like a person has to spend, uh, spend minimum 300 rupees for a meal. So when can Sri Lanka come out of the situation of crisis? Like when can it be expected? Who is the panelist? Oh, you. <laughs> Please do not confuse India rupee and Sri Lanka. The rate is different, yes. But if you say the Indian rupee has been the rupee are only to three, on the ground it will be only six or seven. Because the cost is different, rupee value is different. But as I said, in the last 10 years they didn't create new jobs, all the jobs were in the government. Now today there are 1.5 million government employees there. IMF is going to all the to cut down. Such uh, significant economies told me. We don't need more than one and a half back to 200,000 jobs. But if the government doesn't support these people, who is going to support? And what will be the social cost? And what will be the political cost as militancy and other things? Two, outside Colombo, I was told about a month back by friends who have traveled from Colombo across the country, food is still cheap. The prices have gone up. Dollar, I mean, dollar rate has gone up, but it is still available and cheap. It is in Colombo, it gets magnified because of cost of living factors. Right? And uh, about 2011, immediately after the end of the war, in Northern Sri Lanka, a couple family told me we need 1,000 to 1,500 rupees, very poor family, immediately after the war, to have one day's tea. We have two children and the other husband and wife, and we don't care. Today, that 2,500, right, they have gone up to 5,000 or 7,000. Because gas prices, don't get you get 25 kg here. Today, I think if they are not the same, there is no gas available today. As of this morning and yesterday, cooking gas, but it costs close to 5,300 rupees. A gas cylinder of 20 kg. That is the kind of price that you have to imagine. So, but don't compare it with the Indian prices. But if you go to India and just this Sangeeta and have a meal, it is going to cost you greater in India. Right? So, we are not any better, uh, better off. I totally agree with you there. Uh, so, this is the final uh, round for the panelists. If they have any concluding remarks uh, before we close the panel. Uh, so after the Shwadan, we have Jahan and the memory coming with their new points and then we'll conclude the other two points. And I, I will take just about 60 to 90 seconds, not more than that, as time will pass. But one aspect that I find here is that, like, to a question, like, will there be a socialist uh, uh, response or a communist response, and then saying that, Communists and the socialists are weak, but the change does not depend on socialists or communists for change. And politics is a great game. I want this one basic thing to go. Politics is an endless game. People will fight that. No, no matter whether there is a socialism, there is a communism, we are talking about basic rights and basic food, access to it. And like, you know, we don't have to rely on communists and socialists to bring about the things. Therefore, I constantly believe politics is one thing that will bring a change. You name it as communism, you name it as a socialism. Ultimately, you have to meet the people's demands. I think Sri Lanka has to stand and face its side. Thank you. Uh, even as we go to the online uh, speakers, could I kindly request the students to maintain silence, please? I know you're standing between you and much, but bear with us for the last 10 minutes. Yes, um, 
I think, I think one, one obviously agreeing with everything that all the panelists have said so far. Um, but more importantly, I think looking to the future, because that has been one of the questions. Um, speaking from an education perspective, a trauma perspective, we're now having generations of people who have been traumatized in a different way. We are having generations whose education, formal education, has been disrupted for minimum three years and it will continue to be so. So we are going to see the repercussions of this in another 10, 15 years time and that it will continue to happen. So as much as we look at short term solutions, we should prepare for an emergence of these issues coming to fruition in another 10, 20 years as well. Yeah, if I may speak now, uh, I would say that at this time, the, the priority in people's minds is from where is the government going to get the dollars to import uh, the essentials, the essential food, the essential petrol, diesel. So, so, at, so at the time, the priority for people is whether the government can get money from the IMF. I mean, they're all most people are looking to the IMF now because we know that India cannot, India has been extremely generous, but India can't go on giving us more and more credit. So we have to get something, our systems right. And we think that the IMF is going to provide us with the money that for the longer term sustainability. Now, in that, I think, I mean, of course, the left party, there are strong left parties. They will insist that there should be social justice that that uh, the subsidies should that the poor people need to be looked after that that will be there but uh, i think the majority of people are now just looking to see what will work what will get them the petrol diesel food medicine that we need and uh, so that will be the priority uh, my hope is that uh, that uh, in the months ahead that the government uh, because we have now a very a rational president, a prime minister, a prime minister who actually is not a person who's a populist. And that's why he always loses elections. When Whenever he uh, is in power, he can't really hold on. But here, because he is with a populist government headed by a populist president who's very powerful, that maybe the president will be able to provide him with the, the space to undertake the necessary reforms that we need, both in terms of economics, for economic sustainability, as well as to deal with our ethnic issues, our ethnic conflict, our issues of power sharing. That is, of course, my hope. But I think in the longer term, this, if then there are elections, this uh, present, uh, the present parliamentarians will probably lose badly the, from the ruling party. And we will get a new crop of politicians who will have to take on the baton. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think that uh, Sri Lanka even today has the highest in here, human development in South Asia, highest per capita in Africa, and find itself in the short term solution. I think it's affected by present policies.
right? This is going to be the situation for some more time to come. But in between, they have worked on the economy, but they are focusing on politics. Your politics is out there in the street, and economy is out in the economy. India or IMF or what? This is a parody or paradox of the paradox of Sri Lanka is becoming a paradox. That they have to address. Thank you. Thank you, uh, all the panelists. So uh, I just have a couple of points to just conclude this awesome uh, session that we've had. First is the uh, point on potential, that there is a potential for change, potential to make it more plural, to make it more uh, inclusive. So there is a potential with all the mass movements that we've had. But there is also a problem of inclusivity, which is which Jahan uh, pointed out. The question on the North and the Northeast, whether any future equation still make it equal, equal, uh, inclusive enough for them. So there is the problem. But the last point I want to tell is the promise, the promise which is taken by democracy. Because in plural societies, the only response or the answer can only be democracy. I'll just conclude with this one quote. A writer once said this about peace in South Asia. For us in South Asia, peace is not a target. It is a process. It is not a building, but a tool like a kaleidoscope. It is both robust and fragile. After all, a kaleidoscope is a bit of cardboard, a few rubber bands, and a bunch of broken glass bundles sticking hopefully together. Peace is a perpetual hypothesis tested and verified every day in South Asia. A people's peace cannot be an expert's peace. So it is an Uh, to appreciate with a round of applause to the panelists. I'd like to congratulate and thank all the panelists for such a detailed demonstration. Thank you. Now, moving on, I'd like to call Dr. Dean Bairbethin, Assistant Professor of Humanities and Social Sciences, for the for the block, to kindly deliver the word of thanks. Thank you.